What is up with a method of thinking that does not value the most important thing on the face of the earth? Now, pastor, you're off. You're overestimating the value of church. No, I'm not. Listen, this building is not the most important thing. But what's happening in here right now is the most important thing that you'll face all week long. Yes. Oh, you don't know I have a job interview and, and I've got something going on with my kids and all this stuff. Well, listen, if you cannot understand what it's like to come out to set rule and reign, let me go ahead and, um, and define church, right? The ecclesia is a group of citizens called out from their homes to set rule and dominion over an area, right? So what we're doing right now, that's what was happening up here. It wasn't some, you know, just whatever, ritual, because we wanted to lay hands on some kids. No, it's that's impartation. That's spiritual. This is spiritual stuff up here that's happening. That's calling out of them. Listen, if some of these, now I'm not talking about your kids, I'm not, and I'm not questioning your parenting, but some of these kids have never had that pulled out of them before. There are some kids that today experience something that's never happened to them before. They're a spirit. They have a soul. They live in a body. You've got to understand how to live spiritually right in the middle of a physical body. And until you're taught, until you learn, you won't know. A lot of adults, they, they confuse what's going on in their physical body. They, can, they confuse their emotions. They confuse their thoughts, their feelings, and their, their desires, their you know, carnal desires or things like that. They, they think, what's wrong with me? What's happening? Well, they don't understand spirit, soul, and body. And so they don't understand how to draw spiritual things out of themselves. That's what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy. He said, stir up the gift. Fan the flame. He said, make sure that that spiritual, those embers that are on the inside of you that were, how? By the laying on of hands. Something spiritual happened. There was a fire that was kindled by the laying on of hands that drew him and called him and pressed him into the ministry. Impartation of strength, an impartation of grace, an impartation of heavenly divine authority in that man's life. And Paul said, stir it up. Paul said, you've got to stir it up. Why? Because sometimes you don't feel like X or Y or Z or A or B or C. Sometimes you don't feel like. Come on, somebody. Sometimes you don't feel like it. Sometimes, <coughs> excuse me. Sometimes you don't feel, I just don't feel it today, Pastor. Well, so what? You really need to come to church if you ain't feeling it today. That's when you need to exercise spiritual authority over your feelings and say, I don't care what I feel like. I'm going to go get fed because probably, most probably, what's getting ready to happen at church that day is the thing that you need the most. And the enemy knows that you need it the most. You need impartation the most. You need, you know, I'm telling you now, God wants to do something in you. He wants to stir something up on, on the inside of you. He wants Holy Spirit to start moving in your life. And as I speak something over your life or as somebody speaks it over your life, a prophecy coming in the door or walking out the door, somebody speaks the word over your life. And it's exactly, exactly what you've been thinking about all week. And you thought you were nuts. But you needed that impartation so that you can, and it's a constant reminder, right? Because we, you know, it, sometimes it takes us a while to get things. Sometimes we're a little slow on the uptake, as they used to say, right? Sometimes it takes me three or four times to get something, or three or four dozen times. My parents might say, you know, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, they might have said that. It might take me a little while to get something, right? Chew with your mouth closed, you know, put your toys away. Make sure you close the garage door. Makes whatever. Maybe, maybe you didn't, anybody have kids? Can you relate, right? Have you said some things until you're blue in the face, right? Yeah. All right, so I'm not the only one, right? Okay. But listen, some of us are a little slow as adults on the uptake. Some of us don't realize that we are a spirit, have a soul, live in a body. And we're still, even though you've been hearing pastor say it, some of you maybe for five years or two years or one year or 10 years or whatever, or you've been hearing some pastor say it for 20 years, maybe, but you're still having a hard time figuring out how to crucify your flesh or renew your mind so that your spirit man can rule and reign in your life. Amen. This is big yes. right now. <clears throat> I'm going to say some things. I'm going to say something right now. I know that there are some people in here that are going to think that I'm 
I'm bat crazy, okay? But right now, right this instant, you are as righteous spiritually as Jesus. Yes. That ought to make a mummy shout. Yes. I'm telling you right now, that ought to just bring it right out of you. Spiritually, you're a spirit, you have a soul, live in a body. Your fingernail never got saved. It's not going to be until you get a glorified body. Right now, all of this physical stuff, it's all subject to decay. It's all subject to physical death. But now I'm a spirit. I have a soul, mind, will, and emotions. So listen, your mind is not as right as Jesus. Your will is not as right as Jesus. And your emotions aren't as right as Jesus because you give in to them a lot quicker than he did. His emotions were working on him. His will was working on him in the garden. And he said, no, it's not my will. Yeah. See, he crucified his will. And then your flesh is just at the bottom. People have a hard time quitting smoking or quitting this or quitting that. These fleshly things, literally these fleshly carnal desires. I, well, I don't know why we pick on smoking. We being we preachers. I don't know why we pick on smoking more than Mountain Dew. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I smoked the equivalent of four packs a day in Mountain Dew not long ago. <laughs> Those of you guys don't understand my metaphor. It means I drank a lot of Mountain Dew, right? I, I'm, just, I'm just for those of you that are slow in the uptake, right? I just got to make sure I keep, keep, keep going. And I was going through a, a place in my life. It was July 18th, I think, 18th or 20th of 2017. And I told Jennifer, headed back, we were in Gatlinburg. We were staying in a hotel. We came back from uh, South Carolina. And uh, we stopped for two nights in Gatlinburg on the way back to the end of our vacation. We were, uh, had a, a case of Mountain Dew put in, the, put in the refrigerator at the hotel. And um, there was about 12 or 13 of them left or whatever. We got in the car to drive back. And I said, I'm not going to drink that for, for a while. You know, and I had given it up for week or two at a time, a month at a time or whatever. I had no plans. I told the Lord, I said, um, I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't this, I'm doing this for 30 days, you know, or I'm doing a 21 day, whatever. No, it wasn't like that. It was different. It was, I know that some, there's something about this that I just need to not be putting in my body. And one day turned into two, turned into three, turned into four, turned into three and a half years. I never had another one until around Christmas of 2020, and now I might a couple times a month. It, it, does, it doesn't have a hold of me, right? I really probably shouldn't drink any of them, but I'm just saying, I mean, there are things in our life that we can crucify, watch this, because I took a spiritual approach to it. Yes, yeah. that's right. I took a spiritual approach to it, and I said, Father, I know there's just something in my spirit. I know you don't want me drinking these like a fish. You know what I mean? I know there's something about this that's just not good for me. Well, <clears throat> and don't anybody look now, but I mean, I have probably 25 more pounds to lose, but I lost like 40 pounds and, and got myself into a place where I, I just was so much better. I could do more. I could, I, could, I could hear, this sounds crazy, but I could hear the Spirit of God more clearly in my life. Because I silenced the voice of Mountain Dew screaming at me all the time that you want one of those. See, when you have that screaming at you, those desires, all of a sudden you're thinking about other things. It could be a TV show. It could be whatever. But these other worldly things start screaming at you and their voice can become louder than the Father's voice. <clears throat> and so, real church. Let's finish this series today. Real church. This is about setting rule in our life, yes. setting dominion and authority in place. And God, listen, God knew how important people were. Whether it's Mark chapter 16 or Matthew chapter 28, both variations of the, um, the Great Commission, we call it, revolve around people. Jesus died for people. God loved people so much. God loves you. You're a people. If you're a people, raise your hand. All right. Hey, we got more participation in that one. Up to about 80%. This is good. <clears throat> There's going to be something that someday I'm going to ask a question like that, and 100% of people are just going to raise their hand. It's going to be like awesome. So, No, but God loves people. This is all about people. And so <clears throat> if you brought your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Whew. 
1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we've learned a lot. We've, we've, we've learned that Jesus gave himself for the church, purchased with his own blood. <clears throat> Knowing comes from an unction, right? You have an unction and you know all things we talked about there in week two or three. We talked about, um, you know, how it's important to be planted in the house of the Lord. You'll flourish, you'll sprout, bloom, break out, you'll fly. Church is an organism, not an organization. Church is the pillar and the support of the truth, which leads to freedom, Right? Because you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So if the church is the pillar and support of the, of the truth, the church, hmm, glory to God. That's what Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> and now, most recently, last week, we talked about how truth, spiritual truth, comes out through the preaching and teaching of the word, right? So I'm going to... Um, I'm going to finish up today launching from there and getting to a verse of Scripture that most people probably thought would think, like if, if you were a minister and you're going to um, create a series or preach a series on the importance of church, a lot of people, the very first verse they'd go to is in Hebrews, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Well, that happens to be the very last verse that I'm going to go to. Because here's the thing, until you understand what church is all about, you'll forsake the assembling of yourselves yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. Until you know how important it is, yeah. Forsaking the assembling of yourself, why? Don't forget to come to practice. You know, if your coach says, don't forget to come to practice, I mean, you'd be like Allen Iverson. Practice. <laughs> not a game, not a game. Amen. Practice? I need to go to practice? I'm not talking about a game. Practice, right? Well, that's what people, the equivalent of that is church, where people think church why do we need to go to church? Then they find themselves in a tough spot and they call pastor after they haven't been for nine months. They call pastor because somebody's in the hospital. I need you to pray for this person. My kids are falling apart. Oh, I need to, whatever. Where you been for nine months? Because three months ago, I just taught something on that your kids, they wouldn't be having that problem if you'd have been here. That, that's, just, that's just the way it is. And again, that's not condemnation, but we're going to forsake the assembling of ourselves together if we don't think the assembling of ourselves together is important. Right? right? All right. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, I am, uh, I've got a lot that I'm going to fit in. I'm going to fit in over these next 40 minutes or so. So uh, just stick with me because next week I'm, I'm getting into something. This is going to be the end of this series. And, uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is talking the whole entire chapter from the very first verse. Uh, you know, sometimes you that have been around church a long time, you understand that not all often do they, or not always, I should say, do they put the numbers of these chapters in the, in the perfect spot, right? Sometimes it's like, why did they stop that thought? Because it goes right on in. Well, this is one of the examples that they, they really broke this up very well. Because from verse 1 all the way through verse 20, thir or 31, yeah, verse 31 is about this body of Christ and how it functions together. The body of Christ and how it functions together. In fact, chapters 12, 13, and 14, if you, if you want homework, if you want to study that you can do, some of you um, fellow uh, word wordies, that like to study the word, um, go home this week and devour 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. Those three chapters, they flow right together, one, one to the other. Chapter 12 is all about this body of Christ, how it functions together, how we're all members in particular, the eye, you know, can't say that he doesn't need the, you know, you know what I'm saying, the ear and the ear. To, okay, so that's all, we're gonna talk about that. But then it flows right into chapter 13, talks about love. I call this the church love sandwich because chapters 12 and 14 talk about 12 is how the body works together. 14 is how to have a proper church service while you're assembled together. If you have questions about praying in tongues, if you have questions about prophecy, if you have questions about how spiritual gifts are supposed to operate in the church, devour 1 Corinthians 14 this week. The whole chapter, the, start to finish, read it 10 times, okay? But then in the middle, you've got love because love holds the whole thing together, right? Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, you're going to know is the love chapter. So um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to hit some highlights for time's sake tonight, today. 
Um, <clears throat> it says this, now concerning spiritual gifts is in italics. It was not in the original transcript, or transcript, manuscript. It was not in the original Greek manuscripts. Now, so really what this is saying is now concerning spirituals. Yes. Now concerning spiritual things. Now, this, the original Greek literally said, now concerning spirituals, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. So evidently, there can be Christians. He's talking to brethren. Now concerning spirituals, brethren, I would have you to not be ignorant. So evidently, it's very possible for Christian folks, brethren, to be ignorant of spiritual things. Amen. Right? I mean, it doesn't take <laughs> even, <laughs> well, I won't say what I was going to say, but anybody could get that from this verse of scripture, right? Verse two, you know that you were, that you were, that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Now understand this, this word dumb does not mean stupid. This word dumb means they couldn't speak. They don't have a voice. How many people are carried away to some dumb idol that can't talk back to them? I won't name any of them just <clears throat> because I love you guys. Because the moment I start going down through the list of things that can grab our attention and become an idol in our life, somebody leaves the church because I named one of them that's their idol. <laughs> happens every time. It happens. It, it, it's, it's It's amazing. I'm going to name them anyway. <laughs> Leave if you want to. Seriously. I'm just, because I'm called to tell you. Yes. Hunting, fishing, golf, Pinterest, Facebook, yes. sports, travel. Yes. These other things become idols in your life. I'm just telling you, if they become idols in your life, they can't talk back to you. They'll give you an emotional high. They'll fulfill a desire, mind, will, emotions. They'll get, keep your mind right. I got to get out in nature so I can get my mind right. No, you need to get the word of God to get your mind right. I'm just telling you right now, that's the way it is. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind by going out and playing around to golf. No, I'll use mine. I love, I love to play golf. Played about five or six times this year. Just didn't have time for it. But if there was anything that I would really enjoy doing on a Sunday morning, besides preaching, would be go play golf on a nice 74 degree day, the cool breeze. I would love that. I would really enjoy that. But that golf course is not going to talk back to me. It's nothing but a dumb idol that I get carried away to that brings my attention, my mind, my will, my emotion, or my flesh. Something gets carried away, and spiritually, I'm ignorant. I would not have you ignorant of spirituals, brethren. What he's saying is there's things that can pull you away and get you off course, spiritually speaking, and you'll become ignorant about it, and you won't know. You will have a lack of knowledge in that area, and that's how people perish. People perish because of a lack of knowledge. Anybody in the room still love me? Yes. That was the one you guys were all supposed to raise your hand on. Just kidding. All right. <laughs> I would rather have you not be ignorant. You were led astray in these places. Watch this. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now watch this. This starts talking about the importance of all of us gathering together. This is the body of Christ. Ready? This is the meat of it. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. I'm going to read this one in the Amplified. A couple of these I'm going to read in the Amplified. Verse 4. Now, there are distinctive varieties and distributions of endowments, gifts, extraordinary powers, distinguishing certain Christians due to the power of divine grace operating in their souls by the Holy Spirit. And they vary. But the Holy Spirit remains the same. So what he's saying is, listen, you've got, a, he's, Pastor Joel's got a, a gift in his life that functions different than me. Tom has a gift in his life that functions different than my gift. Carrie has a gift in her life that functions different than my gift. But it's the same Holy Spirit giving all of the gifts and the empowerments, the endowments. I'm endued from on high by the Holy Ghost, the same way Jesus was, right? Jesus was anointed, who God anointed 
with the Holy Ghost in power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So Jesus was anointed by the Holy Ghost. He didn't go about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil just because he was Jesus. No, that's why they wrote the verse that way. God who anointed Jesus, who went about doing good. See, in order for any of us to get any kingdom work done, we've got to be anointed. That's the whole purpose of this entire Real church series is to understand that the whole, the entirety of the church, the ecclesia, is built on the revelation that Peter got from heaven, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, on that revelation, I'm going to, that's the rock. That's it, Peter. That's the rock. I'm going to build the entire organism, not organization. I'm going to build the entire organism on this reality that you just got from heaven itself, from the father. That's why the, the anointing is so important. So that's what it's saying. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Now the next verse says, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. I like this verse. I'm gonna read it in the Amplified. And there are distinctive varieties of service and ministration, but it's the same Lord who is served. So in other words, verse four says, there's different gifts operating in, every, in everybody's life. It's the same Holy Spirit that gives those gifts. Yeah. And then those different gifts manifest differently. Some people uh, feel called to lead a prayer ministry. Some people are worshipers at heart. Some people are really good at administration. Some people just love people, even that aren't lovable. Some people are encouragers. This man is one of the greatest encouragers I've ever met in my life on this earth, this planet. I can go down the list. There are different ways and distinctive ways that these things come out, but we're all serving the same Lord. Jesus is the one, he's encouraging people, but it leads them to a faith in Christ Jesus that's sturdy and strong. Yeah. Yeah. And when you love people, when you administer kingdom things, when you're worshiping, when you're praying, whatever, and I'm not putting these guys in a box, I'm just saying those are huge things in their life. I've gotten to know all of these people, and those are things in their life that are just such an encouragement, and it's for the Lord. All of those are working together for the Lord, amen? amen. Hallelujah. Verse six. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Verse seven. I like this one. I like all of them, but this was really good. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. I got to read this one in the Amplified. I have to. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Watch this. The evidence the spiritual illumination of the spirit for good and profit. So I wrote this down in my notes. Every one of these spiritual impartations is to benefit the entire body Amen. of Christ. Why? I know that I'm not the only one that he's encouraged. If Gary Parrott's ever encouraged you, raise your hand in this place. You got more hands raised for you than I did a little while ago. There you go, all right? At, at least 30 hands just went up. So it's to profit, the gift that's in him is to profit everybody. Yes. It's for everybody to glean from, amen? amen. But now here's the thing. Let me, get, let me get our eyes off of Gary for a minute and put your eyes on you for a minute. What's your gifting? What's your, the impartation of the spirit that's in your life? Watch this. Could, if I, say, if I pointed at you, and said, if this person's gifting has ministered to you in the church, raise your hand. Would 30 people raise their hands about you? Now listen, that's not to be condemnation. That's a wake-up call yes. that if that's not the case, then you need to get out of your comfort zone, allow the comforter to comfort you in a different zone, and step out and use your gift to bless somebody. I can't do anything but bake pies. Oh, do I have a job for you? <laughs> right? Everybody's got a gift, and it needs to come out of every single one of us. I got to move on or else I'm going to get stuck. All right. So um, let's go down to verse 18. Verse 18 says, But now God hath set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. Amplified says this, but as it is, God has placed and arranged the limbs and organs. This is big. The limbs and organs in the body, each particular one of them, just as he wished and saw fit and with the best adaptation. Now this is big and this is going to be, 
it could have the tendency to be very heavy. And I got a little ahead of myself coming out of worship, and I shared something then that I was going to share now. I'm going to share it again really quickly so we can capture it uh, for, you know, when this goes to minister to people uh, as, they, as they watch this. In the garden, it really ministered to me this week. I, I was, uh, I can't tell you what this, what this did to me. I was thinking about the grand scheme of things. Uh, those of you... <clears throat> Back to the Future fans, I was thinking about the whole space-time continuum. I was thinking about the Garden of Eden till today. And the, then further on, the Garden of Eden till the great catching away of the church. And then on to, you know, new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem descending out of heaven. Oh. I, I was just thinking about this whole thing. And I was thinking about what God said. First of all, this is just such an encouragement because when you mess up in life, God's got a plan. If you, if you mess something up, you didn't mess up his plan. Amen. Trust me. I promise you that God's bigger than your mess up. Yes. Amen. God's a lot bigger than your foul up. God's bigger than when you miss the mark or when you don't know something to do something right. God's bigger than that. Throw up two hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> but I was thinking about the ultimate foul up. The ultimate mess up was the first one, right? And so, uh, you know, there's a lot we could say about that, but just... For today, let me just say this, um, the same tactic of the enemy, he's not very smart. Amen. He's, it, Satan is not very smart at all. Uh, <laughs> and let me just tell you, he uses the same trick every time. Yes. It's the same one every time. If he can get you to question what God has said, then it'll, it'll manifest a million and one different ways. Yeah. But if he can get you to question the word of God or the voice of God, then, then he'll have you licked. He came up to Eve and he said, hath not God said? He got her questioning, doubting what God said. He got her so confused, because right, he's the author of confusion. God's not the author of confusion. The wicked one is, right? What I talked about earlier, wicked means twisted, like wicker furniture, right? So if God didn't have, if the, the plan of God was not messed up by Adam and Eve's sin, my mess up certainly can't mess it up. Right? So God came in, not with condemnation. He came in with a plan. He came in with hope. He came in with a vision for the future that they could look to and get, start getting encouraged right away. And I can't help but think that, um, I mean, I know if it was me, I'm sure I would do this. If, if it was me, I would tell Cain and Abel and Seth and all the kids, I would tell all of them. I would say, hey, listen, you guys, we messed up. But let me tell you, let me tell you the good news. The good news is God showed up and talked to me right after I messed up. And he told me that through the seed of your mama, his head's going to be bruised. I don't know which one it's going to be of you, but what, through your seed, through, through, through our human race, through our family, the earth is going to be blessed someday. I like to think that Abraham had at least heard something about that before God showed up in his tent one night. I just like to think that way. I don't know. Maybe he hadn't. Maybe the, maybe they hadn't passed it on. But I know that when it got to Noah, Noah got it and he carried it on, right? Okay. So here's the thing. He showed up with the plan. And so I got to thinking about that day. I just, I tried to put myself in the middle of the garden, which biblical Bible scholars will tell you it's somewhere in the Middle East, maybe Baghdad, maybe close to right there. But the Garden of Eden's right there, the river Euphrates, they can pinpoint exactly where it is. They know, I guess, more than me. But, uh, but here's the thing. I got to thinking about myself that day in the garden. And I saw in the plan, I saw how my part fit into the master plan. You're, you need to start seeing this. That, talk about value and talk about importance. Talk about what God needs you to do. He needs you to do your job. Because there might be somebody uh, that, that is in your neighborhood or whatever, in your office or some, in your circle of influence somewhere that needs to hear the gospel from you. Because they'll take their last breath someday and hopefully they believe before they do. Amen. I just found out this morning, I, uh, I was at a, a funeral. I did a funeral a little while ago, a few weeks ago. And Rick said, you know, that, that guy at the funeral that you saw that he said he was an atheist and, and you were joking with him, but you know, I, I was joking with him, but getting my point across, I always tell eight people that say atheist, I always say, you have more faith than I do. Like that's my opening line. I just kind of break the ice. 
said it takes a lot more faith to believe the way you believe about how this all happened than the way I believe it. It takes a lot more faith. And he chuckled about that or whatever. But he, uh, he was pretty tough enough to crack, wasn't he? Took his last breath this morning at 6.05. I don't know if I planted a seed or if I watered. I don't know what I did that day, but God gives the increase, and I believe I'll see him someday. I don't know what happened. You believe in deathbed conversions? Absolutely. <laughs> Just because somebody's kind of closer to death than you were, like in the grand scheme of eternity, when I gave my heart to Jesus, I was this close to death, right? And somebody, just because somebody's a few years ahead of me closer... God's more merciful than we give him credit for. Yes. Amen. That's all I'll say about that. But now here's the thing. In this grand scheme of things, in 6,000 years ago in the garden, God saw Anthony Wade's purpose in pulling in the 11th hour harvest. God saw your purpose. He saw where you fit into this whole grand scheme of things. And if you'll just ask him, he'll start showing you. He's a father that loves you so much and wants to share with his children. It's, it's the father's good pleasure to give. He, he's got a giving heart. That's his nature. He's a giver. He's not a taker. So let's, well, verse 18, I'll say this because I mentioned this verse of scripture in part two or three, and I'll just say this about this verse in the Amplified. In the eight, verse 18, it said, but as it is, God has placed and arranged the limbs and organs in the body. Each particular one of them, just as he wished and saw fit. So when he saw the best adaptation, the way that the body of Christ would fit together the best, he factored your everything, your entire, the entireness of who you are. I don't even know if that's good English, but anyway, we'll say it that way. He factored all that into the equation and put you in the body of Christ where you, where the body of Christ needed you the most. See, you got to hear this before I say not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You got to get what I'm saying now before I read that verse. Because if you really truly believe that God saw fit to place you in the body of Christ with your giftings, and then you say, I, if you say that that means a lot to you and that's valuable to you, and then don't show up to get to give and to impart. My dad says, I mean, you know, he's, he's wise in his own Yogi Bear way. I mean, he's beyond his years <laughs> wise. He's got a lot of yogiisms, but one thing that I love, and this absolutely, this, this has hit me to the core many times. He told me as I was a little boy, he said, what if everybody did it the way you did? He said that a lot. Oh, I just don't, I don't send in RSVPs to weddings. I just show up and expect them to have a meal for me. Well, what if everybody did it the way you do it? What if nobody filled out an RSVP card and they, you know, they had, they thought 10 people were coming and 150 people showed up for a wedding. What if everybody thought of this situation like you think of it? Don't tell me that there are not right and wrong ways to think about things. There are absolutely right and wrong ways to think about everything. I'll go back to Gary as my example. What if Gary, those 30 hands that have been raised, what if oh, you've, been, you've been only been coming here about a year and a half? Right, right, right at the beginning of, we call, is it closer to two? I think it was this winter of maybe 2020 or something. So what if he had decided, nah, they don't need me up there? Because he drives from Northern Kentucky every week. Oh, you guys, some of you guys didn't know that, did you? Okay, so he drives 45 minutes down the street from Tony and Sonia. Oh, he comes up here just to play bass. He comes up here because you got him up, up on stage dancing around. No, he came for a year and a half before, and I never even asked him to play bass. See, but here's the thing. What if everybody did it like you? What if Gary just said, they don't need me? Then none of you 30 people would be able to raise your hand. What if I said, I'm not going to answer the call. There's plenty of preachers out there. They don't need to hear the way I teach. What if, you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. I think this is vital that we take a look in the mirror. This is, this is a call to action at the end of this series. We're at the last week, fifth week. This is a call to action to say, do you really believe everything that I've been preaching? Do you believe that this world needs real church? Why real church? Because there's a lot of play church out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I refuse to have people go around thinking that, that thank you, Jesus. What they've seen that they think is real, 
that perishes with the using that's glitter? Yes. Listen, we need, we need a church. Now, here's, here's where, this is where it gets vital, down on your core level. We need a church. How cool would this be? If we were so intertwined and there was such the eye valued the ear so much and the ear valued the elbow so much and the elbow valued the knee so much and the knee valued the lungs so much because that's one of the things they said, all the limbs and organs. I want to point this out. You can see limbs, you can't see organs. Organs are more valuable than limbs and they're not even seen. Come on now. Oh, I just, I've been there for so long and I've done my part and it doesn't seem like anybody sees what I'm doing. Oh, that you, see, you've got your whole focus on the wrong thing because I know one person that has seen everything you've been doing. Yeah. Oh. And it's not me. <laughs> it's not me. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't really, in the grand scheme of things, I'm way less valuable than the head of the church. He's the pastor here. He is the pastor, the teacher, the apostle, the evangelist, the uh, apostle, prophet. Oh, yeah, I got them all. I'm going to leave one of them out here. We're in this right chapter so I could go look at them. Oh, no, we're not either. Ephesians chapter 4. Forget that. Sorry, I'm, that was my inner monologue I just let out. So, okay. <laughs> Everybody knows that I know where the you know, Ephesians 4 live. Okay, anyway. So, <laughs> back up. Okay. Point being this. <laughs> I got to step on the gas a little bit. Point being this, you're valuable. Yes. All right? So then we won't go through the rest of the chapter. In fact, we'll go to Ephesians 4. <laughs> that was a good leading. We'll just go there and read about this. Because it says basically the same thing that 1 Corinthians 12 was saying. Watch, watch the striking resemblance here about these passages. Um, Ephesians 4, and I'm just going to start in verse 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What does it mean to edify? What is an edifice? A building. So to edify is to build up, right? For the edifying. So, so there are... Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Apostles, because not much can get done without the thumb, right? It's tough to get a lot done. You can't hold on to things. There can't be a good grasp on things without an apostle. A prophet, because he'll point at you and he'll say, thus saith the word of the Lord. An evangelist, because he reaches the furthest. He has the farthest outreach. A pastor, because he's the closest to your heart, right? That's why you wear a ring on this finger. And a teacher, because he's the only one that can get in your ear. <laughs> You guys will never forget the five-fold ministry now, will you? <laughs> but listen, they all work together. They all work together. I teach uh, the basketball teams that I've coached. I took this from Mike Krzyzewski. I can't take credit for it. Um, but anyway, I'm a North Carolina fan. I took something from a Duke coach. But anyway, he says this. He said, you got five players on a basketball court, right? Now, they might be able to do some damage to somebody around, but you put all five of them together, they can go through a wall, oh, Right? I'll never forget that illustration. Every basketball team I've ever coached at the beginning, like the first practice, I tell them that. Because, and the same applies for the church. If you don't have the five-fold ministry working together, boy, you do. There can do, wreck some damage to the body of, of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, right? There'd be a wrecking ball to the kingdom of darkness and do some things, build some things. You know, Matt Spencer has a construction company. He can say, God can build some things with his hands, right? Well, if you don't have those things working together, how can you possibly get some things built? How can you edify the body of Christ if the pinky's out there trying to do all the building? But then it comes to play in you, right? Why? For the edifying of the body of Christ, week one of real church. What did I say? When you hear body of Christ, think church. And when you think church, think body of Christ. They're one and the same. Ephesians chapter one. Go back two verses. Two chapters, rather. Three. Four minus one is three. Come on, get this together today, Anthony. Okay. Verse, 20, uh, verse 22. Has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the 
church, which is what? His body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So you've got to know when you think church, think the body of Christ. When you think body of Christ, think church. And when you think either one of them, understand that the fullness that filleth all in all has been placed into the body of Christ to get things done. Hallelujah. To get things accomplished for the glory of the kingdom. Amen? Amen. I said amen. amen. Hallelujah. So Ephesians 4.11 and 12, for the edifying of the body of Christ, why? How do we know when the job's done? How do we know when the edifying, when the building is complete? What is the building that we're supposed to look to? Verse 13, till. So when you see this, you see that the edifying's working, right? Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, that doesn't mean no mistakes, that word perfect means mature, full grown, complete. Till we come to a complete, full grown, mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, uh uh-oh now, pull your toes back so I don't step on them, ready? That we henceforth be no more children, Now, wait a minute. Yes. Yes, Holy Spirit. Let me slow down on this. Have you, did you see what he just did between those two verses? If you blinked, you missed it. He, the body of Christ, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, teachers are working into the body of Christ to build something up. What? To build up the unity, to come to a mature, full-grown measure of a man. Now, watch this. When that happens, we will no more be children tossed and forth, tossed to and fro. See, so that tells me that until you come to full-grown maturity level, spiritually speaking, then you're going to allow yourself to be tossed to and fro like children. Not mature, like children. They said something about me, so I'm not going back. Well, okay. Well, what about the 30 people that need to raise your, their hands two years from now because of the gift that you placed? You're going to let somebody that messed up, maybe in a moment of, of weakness that said something to you that they shouldn't have said, how about you be mature and go talk to them? Yeah. I'm going to say this right now. I'm going to say this right now. And I'm not going to stutter when I say this. I don't get real stern like this very often, but there will never be one other person in the in, for the rest of this church history till Jesus comes back. Don't you ever come to me and say, where is so-and-so? Where have they been? Yeah. Don't ever say it again. <laughs> you call so-and-so. Yeah. You didn't hear what I just said. Because the moment you come to me and say, where's Jimmy? I haven't seen Jimmy. And where's Susie? I haven't seen Susie. Well, how about you're a member of the body of Christ and you're supposed to edify Jimmy and Susie. Pick up the phone. If you're a man, call Jimmy. If you're a woman, call Susie. That just, this is just good, solid teaching that the body of Christ needs to hear. Because if that's not adhered to, did you see how fast gossip started? If, that, if that's not planted in the ground? I've told people. People say, I've really missed so-and-so. Where have they been? I've told them nicely. When, see, when it's one-on-one, I can, I'm nicer. But, okay, <laughs> I could be a little bit more stern when I'm in this office here, okay? But I'm just saying, don't ask me. And certainly don't go ask somebody else where this person is. Because it doesn't matter. Even if they know, it doesn't matter. Amen. <clears throat> Okay, let's try this. This is the last time we're going to try this today. How many of you still love me? <laughs> All right, okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not fired. <laughs> All right. No, I'm serious now. Listen, okay. I was stern about that, but here, let's get to the meat and potatoes of it. This is the deal. This is why you should never go to somebody else because that other person needs to see your love, God's love, through you shining in their dark place. Not just so they come back to church here. It's fine. I wouldn't be going somewhere where they can be built up. Listen, because if you, where you're planted, remember, he that is planted in the house of the Lord flourishes, blooms, sprout, right? All those things. So you got to be planted somewhere. All I ask is that you don't just casually dabble in this stuff because this, the church is, 
I mean, I can't go back and preach the first four weeks, but let me just go back to the first week real quick. Because what I said when Jesus said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, the very next words out of his mouth, he said, and I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Yes. Whatever you bind on earth shall be what's already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be what's already loosed in heaven. You have no binding or loosing authority if you're not plugged into the master vision of what the ecclesia is. I'm just telling you. I would have to really hate you to not tell you this. That's how important this is. I'm, I'm just, I'm, hear it from the heart of a loving pastor. I'm telling you that you, if you've got things in your life that, that have you bound up instead of you binding them by kingdom authority, or have you go in some loose direction instead of you loosing kingdom authority, then you need to get what I'm saying. Go back on YouTube and watch the whole series again. Let's, let's get this in our head. You guys, not just in our head, renew our mind, but it's got to get in our heart. Not because faith building church is some big something special, but the ecclesia is the most amazing yes, yes, special yes. thing that's ever been created in the history of the planet. The body of Christ? Are you kidding me? He died for it. He purchased it with his own blood. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How can I wrap this up? Okay, I see it. Well, mm, okay, let's stay here really quickly because I want to see. I want you to see this. So it comes on down to verse sixteen, uh, four sixteen. It says, uh, "From whom?" Well, verse fifteen is what I just did, speaking the truth in love. Yes. Amen. Yes. yes. Speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even the anointed one the Messiah. Verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working or the working that's really effective, the effective working in the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So when every part is doing what they're called to do, the whole body is edified. See, it's not just, I like the way that this says this. It starts off in verse 11, talking about the five-fold ministry, right? But then it gets to the point where the, that has to be done so that, verse 13, we all come in the unity of faith. So the five-fold ministry pours itself into you. That's what I'm doing right now. So that you'll come in the unity of faith so that the whole body fitly joined together and compacted with every, whichever joint supplies according to the effective working in the measure of every part. See, it's not just the pastor's job for the whole totality of your life to keep you built up and working and functioning. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So once the, once the pastorate and the evangelists, the, pa the teachers, the apostles, once the, the five-fold ministry pours into your life, now all of a sudden the body comes into unity. And I've seen it happening in this place. My goodness, this, this is a very unified church. So the body comes together and then it starts working itself to where it builds itself up in love. You see how beautiful that is? Oh, it's beautiful. All right, verse 17. This I say, therefore, so all that he just said he said, therefore, and testify in the Lord, so he's doing this, that you henceforth, or from now on, walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. And then it goes on, having the understanding darkened, darkened being alienated. Okay, I won't go through that, but here's what he said. He said, you were at one time Gentiles. But you've, you've been built up and you've grown in the knowledge of this so that you don't walk like the other Gentiles walk anymore. Notice he said this. You, don't, you walk not as other Gentiles walk. He made that distinction because if it was Jews are wonderful and Gentiles aren't, then that would be cause for concern. But if we know that we Gentiles can be grafted in by the blood of Jesus, we're grafted into the tree of the promised family of God. Glory to God. We don't have to walk as other Gentiles walk because we've been grafted into something different and built up in love. Give the Lord Jesus a shout. And then I'm, we're going to quickly wrap this up because I just need to, because I, I can't continue next week this. So let's just go to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read a couple verses here and then give some closing thoughts. Matthew chapter 5, 
Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith uh, shall it be salted? Is it thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a, set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light shine, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So what he's saying is a light is not put under a bushel or a peck measure. The light is placed on a candlestick. Now the light of, the light of revelation, light always speaks to revelation. It's all, it always refers to you being able to see something differently. When you walk in darkness, your eyes are blinded, right? But when you have light on something, you can see it clearly. And that's why Jesus, when he visited John in the first the chapters two and three of the book of Revelation, he said, go give this to the seven candlesticks, the seven pastors of the seven churches that are all around Asia at that time, right? Because the pastors need to get something so that they can get it into the people so the light can shine through the people into the body to edify itself in love. You see how all this is coming together? You're the salt of the earth. Salt, um, if its salt has lost its savor, the Amplified says if the salt has lost its taste, its strength, its quality, there is something about salt that savors things. It, it, um, it preserves. Salt preserves. So there's a preservation quality in this. There is a, a, a hope. Light gives hope right? So the church literally is supposed to give hope and preserve the world. Yes. Yes. <sighs> All right. Um, okay, two more verses, oh, one of them being Hebrews 10. But uh, turn to, uh, matter of fact, I'll just let you put up on the screen, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 28. Proverbs, Proverbs 14, 28. Hallelujah. It says, in the multitude of people is the king's honor. But in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. In the multitude of people is the king's honor. This is why I want our church to grow. Not to build up a kingdom, but it gives great honor to the king. When there's a multitude of people worshiping the king. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And finally... Hebrews chapter 10, the crowning verse to the whole series. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to read verses 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering. Mm. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, that's the hope that I was just talking about in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Where the hope, the church is the hope of the world. Yes. Jesus, both, both parts of the great command, the, the great commission. Now understand it's it's not a singular mission, it's a co-mission. Yeah. We've got help. Thank the Lord Jesus, we have help. I'm not by myself. You're not by yourself. Tomorrow morning when you wake up to face a dark world, you're not by yourself. Amen. You've got a co-mission with the king, with the commander-in-chief. And the whole, the totality, the entirety of the great commission. In Mark 16, you can find it in Mark 16, uh, starting in verses 15 and 16 and on. And you can find it in Matthew 28, starting in verse 18 on. It's all about people. Yes. <laughs> We're to give people hope. Yes. I just felt compelled to say that right before I read these last verses and wrap this up. We're compelled to give people hope. Jesus is the hope of the world. Amen. Oh, such a thrill. A thrill of hope. <laughs> a weary world rejoicing for yonder breaks. New and glorious morn, fall on your knees. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh hear the angel's voice. Oh, 
Night divine. Divine, oh night. When the anointing was born. <laughs> oh night, divine. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The thrill of hope for a weary world. A weary world that has no idea which end is up. Jesus, you are the hope of the world. You are the hope of the world that we can point to you. Not point to ourselves not point to all of our organizational structure at this church, but that we point to you, Jesus. Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our hope. See, this is what this hope is all about. This hope is all about getting into a world and understand, just saturating a world that is weary. Let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. I love this. We're not, listen, well, I'm not holding fast to anything that points to me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. Listen, this hope is not based on me. I have hope because he's faithful that promised. <laughs> if, I, if you have hope because you got a great pastor, well, then don't. You need to hope, have hope because your pastor is pointing you to Jesus. I got to get these last two verses out through 25 and we'll be done. All right. Verse 24. And, and so while we're holding on to hope, we got to be doing something. And let us consider one another to help them raise their hands because of us someday. To help them be able to see, provoke one another to love and to good works because you did your job. Because you stepped in the gap and you ministered to somebody that needed ministered to. That you showed hope to somebody that was seemingly hopeless. The Amplified says it this way. Let us consider and give attentive, watch this, attentive, continuous care. Oh, put that on the screen. Let us, in the Amplified, verse 24, and let us consider and give attentive, continuous care to watching over one another, studying, watch this, studying how we may stir up, stimulate, and incite love and helpful deeds and noble activities. That's what you need to continually be doing, thinking about how you can stir up hope in somebody, stir up some kind of, uh, of, of uh, precious faith in somebody. Yes. Yes. Verse 25. This is, now, this is the key. This is it. This is where so many people start and finish with their sermons on why church is important. Well, we need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Well, that's fine. But until we understand that it's this hope we're holding on to, that we're stirring up people continually, if we don't get this, if we don't get that Jesus bought and paid for the church with his own blood, if we don't get all these things that I've talked about, then we'll forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of, of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Does anybody see the day approaching? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I talked to a young man this week that's just been raptured by the love of God. Absolutely. Oh, it was, it was the most precious thing. He looked like me some, 50, some 25 years ago when God got a hold of me. I just remember the day that I just couldn't stop shaking. I couldn't stop. He couldn't. I, I talked to this young man. I just hugged him. I just hugged him. He just cried on my shoulder. He couldn't talk. <laughs> and I said, that's okay. Remember that. I said, don't, don't ever shun that away. Remember this. Remember this, even so much more as you see the day approaching. Remember this. Don't ever get your focus off of the reason we're here because if we, I'm gonna read one, this paragraph right here, I'm just gonna read it because this is the end. I have to, the Holy Spirit showed me this. We're commanded to not forsake or neglect or abandon the church because if we do so, 
You're literally being at, if you forsake it, you are forsaking the church's importance. You're forsaking your placement in the church. You're planting. You're forsaking the vision of the field that you're planted in. You're forsaking forsaking the saltiness and the light that you're supposed to be. You're forsaking our family, our fellowship, the truth, being a citizen. You're forsaking the group of citizens, the calling out, the setting dominion and authority and kingdom rule. Don't forsake that. Don't forsake your participation, giving yourself to the Spirit. Don't forsake esteeming the gifts. Don't forsake the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Don't forsake unity. Don't forsake knowledge, love, submitting ourselves to growth, personal growth and corporate growth. Don't forsake that, church. Don't forsake that. This is a call. I promise you I'm closing right now, but this is a call to real church. Yeah. This is a call like never before that a world that your neighbors... Do your neighbors, forget church for a minute, do your neighbors even know you're saved? Do your neighbors know that you look through a different lens than they do? Do your neighbors know that you have the hope of the world at your disposal to be able to impart to them the goodness of God? Do they know? What about your work family? Listen, there's a world depending on us. And I just promise you that as we take these steps into being the church that we are called to be and not playing church anymore, but real church, imparting into the next generation, worshiping the King of Kings, how he should be worshiped. Hopefully some of you guys are going to lunch with each other after church. Love on each other. Somebody buy somebody's meal after church today. Just get to know them. Scratch their back, metaphorically. (laughs) Come on now. We need this, amen? Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you, Jesus, that you bled for this church. You literally bled and died to purchase this church, this ecclesia, with your own blood. So, Father, help us by Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit, to know in our knower, in our inner man, by the Spirit, in our spirit, to know what this hope is to know how to share the hope, to know how to participate in the hope and to know how to distribute the hope to a world that is hopeless. I thank you for it, Father. And I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord Jesus a shout. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with a friend today. And remember, most importantly, that Jesus is Lord and you are complete in Him.